having a camera on your helmet that is visible to others is uh, a big deterrent uh, against people acting human, right? They start getting nice and smiley smiley. And oh no, you go ahead. <laughs> I'm on YouTube, so I'll uh, let you go ahead. It's a, the world is different, you know, and I've had people come up behind me yelling at me uh, you know, especially in their big trucks, big macho man, you know, oil worker dude. Just, uh, you know, threatening my life and everything because, you know, I'm taking a second out of his busy schedule by existing. And uh, then I've turned to look in his direction. He's seen the uh, GoPro and then whoop, looks right down at his seat and suddenly he's Mr. Smiley Smile, all right? All right. You know, there's a, a big difference. There's a big difference when you uh, have a camera. What a difference that is. Everybody's like, yay, oh, we're all just wonderful people. That's one thing to be said about surveillance, you know, people being surveilled constantly. They're on good behavior, right? So with the advent of the internet, you're starting to see that happen. You know, anthropologists have always been looking for the most egalitarian societies, or some anthropologists have. Uh, egalitarian in terms of people being uh, relatively equal, having equal say, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, they found some Hutterite uh, colonies have qualified for, you know, fairly egalitarian lifestyle. And the reason behind that is because they've uh, had a lot of face-to-face -face interaction, right? People can't really avoid each other. They're always in close proximity. So it's in their best interest to be on good behavior and to share and be nice and blah, 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 right? And if they're not, they're easily excommunicated from things and reprimanded socially, right? Anonymity can often create a less egalitarian ethos. You know, I'm, I'm speaking in broad terms here, guys, but uh, what I basically, you know, it's, I'm mixing up terms and things, so for all the anthropologists out there, apologies. I do know what I'm talking about, but I'm just you know, saying it for the, the layperson, right? Without going into depth, because that's not my intent, right? <clears throat> anyway, so uh, with the internet, the advent of your internet, you're starting to see that again, right? You're starting to see people get... Uh, reprimanded quite publicly and quite severely for their antisocial behavior and then they're ridiculed and you know the babysitter did this or such and such a star did that and uh you know they're all over the place right the internet and people don't like that so uh lots of cameras although you know you can make the argument that you'd like to have a have some privacy in your existence Lots of cameras also means, uh, you know, people feel that surveillance, right? Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is the presence of the camera affects the psychology of people, right? And while that sounds straightforward, duh, you know you're on camera, there's a little more to it than that, right? So there was this guy, Jeremy Bentham, uh, who lived a long time ago, and... Uh, he came up with the idea for the perfect prison, and what he did was he made a, um, what he called a panoptagon. So essentially he had a central area uh, where guards would theater theoretically be, uh, almost like the hub of a wheel. And then on the uh, outskirts of that wheel were like, uh, were uh, the cells. So kind of like along the perimeter of the wheel, right? Where the cells and the central hub is what had the guards in theory. And Jeremy Bentham speculated and he said, look guys, in theory, you don't need any guards at all. You just need to turn off the light in the central hub office so that the prisoners never know 
if they're being examined or not, if they're being surveilled. So you actually don't even need any guards in this prism in theory. People will curb their own behavior because they feel they're being surveilled, right? Now this Benthamism uh, went on This Benthamism went on to uh, uh, affect other things as well, right? So this uh, Benthamism went on to affect architecture, right? So people read this stuff and they're thinking about social control. How do you control populations? This is all anthropology, guys. If you're interested in anthropology, there's an interdisciplinary field called sociology anthropology. And it's basically anthropology applied to domains that were normally reserved for sociologists. Uh, anyway, that's a pretty... Not complex, it's a pretty detailed and extensive... Uh, area that you need to talk about, so I'm not going to go into that. But essentially, for social control, city planners adopted, uh, you know, this model by Jeremy Bentham of the Panopticon. And what they did was they created, especially in low-income housing, low-income housing, you've got a lot of different buildings and they're facing one another with a lot of windows everywhere, with the and a central park and blah, 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 with the idea that people would police their own behavior because you never know when they're going to be surveilled by someone else. And suburbs followed suit. Because city planning wasn't random, right? People thought of these things. How do you create a docile population? Not necessarily for evil ends, but to, that polices itself. Uh, and they used the ideas of Jeremy Bentham. They had other ideas they used too, right? Like bathroom stalls. Not reaching all the way to the floor. So when you're in a stall, you don't know if someone knows you're in the stall, so you're policing your own behavior as well. <coughs> Ideally, right? So a lot of this stuff was going on. And, uh... <coughs> oh, sorry, I got a cold again. I always have a cold. So anyway, it followed suit with uh, suburbs, right? They were designed in such a way that... Uh, and you see it today with houses with larger windows. All the houses today have gigantic windows. And some windows you can't even cover with curtains. Or you're supposed to just leave bare so everybody sees you. That's the idea, guys. This is coming from Benthamism, right? Now, the architects might not know it as Benthamism, but that's how it started, and it slowly bleeds its way into planning, city planning, right? Architecture for social control. So basically, this same thing is going on in an extended way and a disembodied way with the internet. People are getting called more and more, and they're not, never knowing if they're on camera or not, and it's starting to affect people's psyche, right? And it affects my psyche because I know I'm on camera. I know that this is going to go on YouTube. And I have to be careful uh, to only say what I don't really think. <laughs> so anyway, you guys know what I'm talking about anyway. So yeah, this sociology anthropology is an interesting field. I did... Uh, I uh, went to university and uh, studied some anthropology and uh, went into this uh, sociology, anthropology, interdisciplinary field, which was, like I say, it's not sociology, it's anthropology applied to areas that are, were usually under the domain of sociology, right? So instead of questionnaires, um, you're going to study crack and you know, the underground economy and, you know, crack cocaine networks and stuff like that. An anthropologist, uh, instead of passing out questionnaires to the crack dealers and crack users, uh, an anthropologist would use participant observation where they would um, get involved. They'd either go undercover or they'd be up front and, yeah, no, it would be more... No, an anthropologist would be more likely to, uh, a lot of ethics involved in this, so an anthropologist would more likely let the, uh, 
people know that they're being studied, right? So he would, uh, or she, would more likely join the crack dealers, right? And hang out with the crack dealers, if not sell crack. <laughs> you know, anthropologists get in a lot of trouble because they recognize that governments and the like, uh, you know, these are all just rules for rules sake. There's nothing in, there are no intrinsic moral moralities to uh, these rules and regulations and policies and codes of conduct. And there are very few codes of conduct that are in, uh, universal. Uh, killing is one. All cultures have strict rules surrounding uh, killing. Murder is a legal term, right? Killing is killing. Murder is a legal term, right? So, yeah, all societies have sanctioned and unsanctioned killing. There are times when you're allowed to kill, times you're not allowed to kill, right? Uh, and a universal one, I think, is, uh, yeah, that's the only one I know of that's universal amongst all cultures. Everything else is wearing a banana on your head and walking backwards on Saturdays and close physical contact and everyone having a group orgy in the middle of a field and you're trying to reach the sky with your numbers. And another culture is, we're a consumer culture. We're, uh, our social rules uh, kind of come out of buying stuff. So this whole, I'm an individual, I'm competing with other individuals, me am me, I number one, me am good, me can jump, Nike this, Nike that. Guys, that's not because we're in this wonderful freedom bill. We're free to buy stuff. That's so you see yourself as an individual and you want to cloak yourself in the individual tracking, uh, trappings because you're a consumer. Your value is as a consumer. So that's why everything is me. You don't know who you're talking to. When really we're all pretty worthless in the great scheme of things. It's just that capitalism convinces yourself that you're, uh, convinces uh, individuals, a land of competing individuals that purchase stuff, that they're important. And uh, you know, you're an individual, just like everyone else, right? So anyway. That was a long spiel, man, on anthropology, but anthropology is an awesome field. It's underfunded because no government likes it. You know, it's, it, it takes apart our culture and, uh, you know, and shows us how weird it is and why we do this and why we do that and what this reason is. And very seldom are they, uh, you know, functional reasons, right? A lot of functionalists, you know, there, there's a lot of good to uh, be had in uh, functionalism, <clears throat> right? Durkheim and all that stuff. But uh, he was a sociologist. Anyway, I'm getting off topic again, or on topic. But basically, there are a lot of reasons why we do what we do. It's often not because of our environment. It's all, it's because of our interpretation of our environment. And our interpretation affects the environment and other interpretations. Because it's, it's very complex, right? <coughs> you can plunge an anthropologist down anywhere. I often said, uh, and psychology is an art. It's not a science. Psychology is not a science, right? And it's not a science because it's not testable. Right? And that's a real bone of contention amongst, you know, the psychological associations. Um, because it's not a science. You know, they masquerade as a science, but it is an art. Right? It's a philosophy of the mind. These things aren't testable. Right? That's why it's not a science. To be a science, it has to be testable. And most of psychology is not testable. Right? Not, not to the extent that would be required for a science. Right? So there's a lot of theory with no testing, right? And anyway, I often used to say, you know, if you want to find out about life and why you do what you do and rewire yourself, you know, it would be more beneficial to see an anthropologist than it would be a psychologist. Unless you had some... Uh, malady of the mind, like some organically caused uh, uh, malady, you know, like, uh, I don't know. 
you know, something you definitely needed medication for.